Hello and welcome to lecture five, where we're going to talk about three different types of amplitude modulation. DSB, SSB and VSB. And we'll look at what these three things stand for in a few minutes. So last week we spoke about how to demodulate AM after previously speaking about amplitude modulation. So these are three more variants of amplitude modulation, each with their own unique properties. We're going to talk briefly about that, and next week we'll talk about how to demodulate, how to recover, how to detect these signals. And together, these six lectures will all be included in your class test on March the 17th. So watch out for that. And in terms of our schedule, we are now still in week four, but this is the lecture that would have normally been delivered in week five. I brought it earlier so that we can use that for the content for Wednesday's problem class. Just a quick reminder that before Sunday, make sure you complete the weekly progress check. Also, just another reminder that the session on the 3rd of May isn't going to happen because it's a bank holiday. So that is a bank holiday. I've moved the content or the, the, the Monday session to Wednesday and I've moved the Wednesday session to the following Monday. So this is the updated schedule you should find that on canvas and it is correct now okay so a recap from last lecture after speaking about amplitude modulation we introduced amplitude demodulation or the demodulation of am we introduced this simple envelope detector consisting of a diode rectifier and a resistor capacitor low pass filter that would trace the envelope and recover our message. And even though that message or that envelope isn't equal to our original message, it is close to our message. So it's a distorted version of our message. And we're happy to accept that slight distortion um, that, that's dependent on the, the choice of the time constant, RC. So provided RC is chosen so that um, uh, 1 over RC is between the modulating frequency, that's the frequency of the message, and the carrier frequency, FC, we should have a slight rippling that is generally acceptable. So remember the envelope detector is uh, a form of asynchronous demodulator or a non-coherent demodulator. That just means that there isn't a local oscillator generating a local version of the carrier at the demodulator. That will become clearer next week when we speak about synchronous or coherent demodulation of DSB. Now, we also spoke about the power efficiency of AM, and we said AM isn't particularly efficient in terms of power because most of the power ends up in the carrier. So the um, uh, power efficiency is generally less than 33%. So that means more than 66%. 0.7% of the energy is wasted in the carrier. And we said that even though we call it wasted, it's still um, a feature of AM that allows low-cost uh, receivers, simple receivers, to be able to recover the message without having to rely on um, uh, a local power supply and um, uh, complex electronics. So the um, low power efficiency of AM is uh, a feature rather than necessarily a, um, a, a reason to avoid it. 
Now today we're going to talk about three different variants of amplitude modulation that um, are different, that don't suffer the same disadvantage. They come with a, um, a range of different uh, advantages and disadvantages. So we're going to speak first about DSB-SC. Now, if you compare that with DSB-LC, that's the AM that we're familiar with, the L in DSB-LC stood for large. So DSB-LC is DSB with a large carrier component. Now the S in DSB-SC doesn't refer to small. It stands for suppressed. And suppressed means no carrier. So DSB-SC means double sideband without a carrier. Okay, so we're talking about no carrier. Not small carrier, but no carrier. Sometimes we just call it DSB. So DSB means DSB suppressed carrier. And SSB, the S, refers to single as opposed to double. So that means we only have one sideband, an upper or a lower sideband. And again, SSB actually means SSB suppressed carrier. But we often just drop that and say SSB, and it's understood that it's SSB suppressed carrier. And the same with vestigial sideband. Now, um, vestigial, you can understand that to mean partial. And that doesn't mean that vestigial means partial. Vestigial means the, the remainder or the, the remains off, the leftover off. So vestigial sideband means you have the remainder part of a second sideband. So you have one sideband and a part, a section, a segment, the remains of a second sideband. So it's not single and it's not double, it's somewhere in between. So that was a summary of today's lecture. So um, this is AM as we know it. This is your baseband signal. Your baseband signal starts at zero hertz and it has a finite bandwidth, FM. So that's your bandwidth, FM. After modulation, we now have three important components. We have a carrier component, that's this here at FC. We have an upper sideband, that's this here. And we have a lower sideband, that's this here. So these three components together form AM, or DSB with a large carrier. This is just the negative frequency um, reflection of that. So the carrier is there, the lower sideband is there, and the upper sideband is there. But you can ignore that and just focus on that side of the frequency axis. So that's double sideband. And the important thing to note here is that the bandwidth is twice FM. Why is it twice FM? Because we have an upper sideband and a lower sideband, and that's why we call it double sideband. So when we talk about DSB-LC, we have a large carrier. When we talk about DSB-SC, as we will in a minute, that carrier component disappears. So now we're going to talk about suppressed carrier. Mathematically, remember what S of T looked like. So this is S of T um, for AM. So let me just make that clear. For AM, S of T looked like that. What we're going to do, we're not going to suppress the carrier by adding a carrier component, by adding DC and then removing it. Although that's what it looks like when we illustrate it like this. It looks like we're just going to remove that and end up with that. That's what it looks like. But in fact, we're going to generate our DSB, suppressed carrier. And now I can actually call this DSB suppressed carrier by multiplying 
of the carrier times the message. So that's your carrier, and that's your message. So by simply multiplying the two, we end up with our DSP signal. Notice with our DSP signal, your message looks something like that. So what do you see immediately? You see that it's not possible to trace the envelope because you have this phase reversal here. So you have distortion, i.e. the envelope isn't equal to the message. So what does that mean? It means we can't use an envelope detector we can't use an envelope detector to recover DSB-SC. We'll talk about the recovery of DSB-SC, the demodulation of double sideband suppressed carrier, next lecture. So for now, let's just focus on the modulation. So the modulation, in the case of DSB-SC, is simply multiplication nothing else. We're not adding any DC. We don't have a modulation index because there's no DC. So these are the things that have changed. Some things haven't changed. So the bandwidth hasn't changed. We still have DSB. So the bandwidth is still twice the original bandwidth. That hasn't changed. The power efficiency has changed because we don't have a carrier component, so therefore we don't have wastage in power. So the power efficiency is much higher. You could say it's 100% because there is no wasted power. All the power is useful power. So this is our familiar uh, spectral plot where this is M of T, and this is the spectrum of M of T, our baseband signal. This is S of T, and this is the spectrum of our band pass signal. We still have an upper sideband, we still have a lower sideband. The bandwidth is still twice FM, so it's still double sideband, no surprise there. But what's missing? Where's the carrier component? We're expecting to see something happening at FC, but there's nothing there because it's suppressed. There is no um, carrier component. So that's what I wanted to show here. And this is where our message is some arbitrary signal with a spectral representation like that. Now, if our message is a single tone, so this is a single tone message. What does single tone mean? It simply means that we have a single cosine here. So therefore we have a single frequency. So for a single tone message, the spectrum looks very similar. So remember previously it looked like that, now it just looks um, like this. It's very similar. We have a low frequency FM, we have a high frequency carrier, so this is your high frequency carrier, and this is the spectral representation. So remember these spectral representations, we can call them spectra. A spectrum is a representation where we have frequency as our horizontal axis. We use something called a spectrum analyzer to look at these spectral representations. So just like an oscilloscope will give you a representation where the horizontal axis is time, a spectrum analyzer or a frequency analyzer will give you a spectral representation or a trace where the horizontal axis is frequency. So when you multiply these two signals, so here if I multiply the message times the carrier, I end up with something that looks like this. So this is your 
original message there. The envelope isn't very helpful, but look at the spectrum. We have a spectrum, a component at Fc plus minus plus Fm and Fc minus Fm, but we don't have a component at Fc. That doesn't exist because this is no longer DSB LC. It's DSB SC. So, what's the difference between what we previously referred to as AM or DSB LC and DSB SC? Well, there's um, no carrier component, that's one. The power efficiency is 100%, and just to be clear, we're talking about this. The bandwidth is still twice the baseband bandwidth, but nothing has changed in terms of the composition of the sideband. They're still um, the same, and the upper sideband and the lower sideband both contain the same information. So, why are we transmitting the same information twice? Why can't we suppress one of the sidebands? So, instead of having two sidebands, instead of having two sidebands, why can't we just transmit one? Now, that is where SSB comes in, single sideband. Now, in single sideband transmission, rather than transmitting an upper sideband and a lower sideband, we filter out one of the sidebands and just transmit, for example, the upper sideband or the lower sideband. So it's this or that, okay? It's not both. It's either the upper sideband or the lower sideband. What happened to the carrier component? Why is there no carrier component? Well, for DSB and SSB, we eliminate the carrier. There is no carrier. We're talking only about um, the sideband. Why do we do that? Even though DSB suppressed carrier had 100% power efficiency, we can still save power by using less of the frequency axis. So we're using less spectrum, therefore we're we can put all of the power that we put in there, we can put into that or we can simply save power. So there's two ways of thinking about it. We, we can either use the same power and have um, twice as powerful a signal, or we can um, use half the power. Because in either way, we're using half the frequency. So that allows other channels or other users to use the remaining frequency. So you're making space for something which is called frequency domain multiplexing, and we'll talk about that in our final lecture. Okay, so this is good because it allows us to save on bandwidth and improve SNR. Remember SNR, signal-to-noise ratio? Now, why do we improve the signal-to-noise ratio? Because we're using less bandwidth. Now, because we're using less bandwidth, there's less opportunity for noise to affect your signal. So if noise is attacking your signal here or here, then our signal won't be affected because we're using less of the bandwidth, so less of an opportunity for noise to affect our signal. Now, these advantages come at a cost, and the cost is the complexity. The complexity comes at um, a uh, cost, and also there is the issue of stability. Okay, so this comes at the expense of the complexity in order to actually filter out one of the two sidebands, and that complexity translates into the cost of the devices. So, what does it look like in the frequency domain? So, if you have 
a spectrum that for the baseband signal that looks like that, then you'd have an upper side band that looks like that by removing the lower side band. You could remove the lower side band or you could remove the upper side band. In either case, you would have an a, a bandwidth of FM rather than 2FM. So this is DSB and this is SSB. So you can block either upper or lower side band. How do you block it? Well, you need a filter. What kind of a filter? So here the, the, the shape of the spectrum has changed, but that's fine. You need a filter. What kind of a filter would block all frequencies higher than the carrier frequency? You'd need something called a high pass filter. Sorry, what I meant was what kind of filter would uh, block frequencies If you wanted to keep the um, upper side band and block the lower side band, you would need a high pass filter that would block the low frequencies. Alternatively, if you wanted to keep the lower side band and block the high, um, the upper side band, you would need a low pass filter or a bandpass filter. Now, here, what I'm trying to show you is that for an ideal filter, you would be able to get this sharp transition. But in real life, your filter will always have this roll-off. And this roll-off here means that you will always have some leakage from here. You'll always pick up some of the other sideband. Now, the closer, the closer your filter gets to this, the more complex and expensive it becomes. Okay, so what you want is an ideal high pass filter or a filter with a very high Q factor, a very sharp filter that requires um, higher order and higher complexity. Now the third member of the amplitude modulation family we wanted to talk about today is vestigial sideband. Now vestigial sideband is where rather than having two sidebands or one sideband we have one sideband so that we have one sideband and the remains of the other sideband. So here we were talking about leakage happening when you have a non-ideal filter so that some of the lower sideband or let's say the other sideband is retained. The same happens here. So for vestigial sideband, you keep one sideband you block the other sideband, but not completely. So you need use a non-ideal filter, and you end up with one sideband and a little bit, the remainder of, or the leftovers, the remains of another sideband. And we use this mainly, or almost exclusively, for analog television. Okay, so analog television, um, is on its way out. There are not many places in the world that still use analog television. But it's still important for an electronic engineer to understand what vestigial sideband is and what the spectrum looks like and what applications uh, it has. So uh, the uh, terrestrial analog TV signal consists of audio using FM and video using VSB. And it's at a particularly high frequency, even though it's amplitude modulation, it's still a, a very high frequency. So because we're talking about a uh, message bandwidth or a message signal of um, 4.5 megahertz, that's not kilohertz, that's megahertz. So 
Twice that would be 9 megahertz, and that's a lot. So to reduce that 9 megahertz, we use one sideband and only part of the other. So this sideband, for example, the lower sideband is 4.5 megahertz. For the upper sideband, we wouldn't retain the full 4.5. We could retain for example, 2 megahertz. So you'd have a total bandwidth of 4.5 plus 2, which is less than 9. Okay, so how much is retained will depend on the filter and on the application and on the particular TV signal. And whether we use the upper or the lower sideband will also depend on um, uh, several factors. But the uh, point we need to understand about vestigial sideband is that we have one sideband and a partial second sideband. So this is the uh, television signal. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's an audio section. This is the audio with an audio carrier. But this is actually frequency modulated. And then you have your upper sideband here and your lower sideband here. The upper sideband is transmitted in full and this lower sideband is transmitted partially. So the total bandwidth in this case is limited to 7 megahertz. That's starting from here, which is almost halfway in the middle of the lower sideband up to the end of the audio signal. So we include the upper sideband, part of the lower sideband, and here we're actually including the, um, the uh, audio, which is frequency modulated. So this is just an example to illustrate what a vestigial sideband um, spectrum will look like. It's impossible to visualize this in the time domain. That's why we're looking at it only in the frequency domain. Same with SSB. We're interested in the spectral representation, not the time domain representation. Again, I've shown you this um, illustration or something similar to this before, just so that you appreciate that whenever we speak about AM, we're talking about um, frequencies in the kilohertz or the very low megahertz. As we start talking about FM, we're now talking about hundreds or, well, 88 to 108 megahertz. We're talking about megahertz. And as we increase our frequency towards gigahertz and beyond, we now look at different types of applications including cellular and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, 5G, GPS, etc. So we started lectures 1, 2, 3, 4 here. And as we progress lectures 6, 7, 8, we'll be increasing um, the frequency range that we'll be looking at. So now a quick comparison to end our lecture. Um, of the different applications of amplitude modulation. So amplitude modulation includes the whole family. So it includes DSB-LC, DSB-SC, SSB, and VSB. So we'll be looking at all of these. So we looked at this in some detail. We looked at this in some detail. SSB and VSB, we haven't looked at it in much detail. But that's all we need to appreciate is why it exists, what it's used for, and what it looks like in the frequency domain. So for AM, we've spoken about it a lot. We've spoken about the bandwidth. We've spoken about the fact that it's used for AM broadcast, for voice and music. We've spoken about the simplicity to demodulate it. All you need is a, a very simple circuit. 
and we've said that the carrier is transmitted and we've, we've spoken about how wasteful it is. So where will you see it? Well, the AM masts you'll see if you look carefully and AM radios, if you have one of those in the house or if you, you notice um, almost all cars have radios, they'll have digital um, DAB radios, but they'll also have long wave and medium wave AM radios, and you can also always notice the antenna at the top. So DSB SC, so suppressed carrier. This is different. It operates at a higher frequency, and there's less transmitted power than AM. Why is there less transmitted power? Because there is no carrier component. Now all of the power is useful, so it has a power efficiency of 100%. Where do you find it? You often find this in uh, applications like air traffic control. So at the airport, the air traffic controllers use DSB, but you also find this for in um, the remote controls for garage doors and for uh, car fobs. So um, in situations like this where you have short range, where power is important and where you have limited power at the transmitter, you don't have the ability to waste or you don't have the capacity to waste power in the carrier. You um, uh, you use DSB-SC. So I wanted to share with you this little um, uh, YouTube clip. It's about an anecdote I spoke about in a previous lecture. It's about something that happened in 2019. We have new information on a mystery in North Olmsted. We have been telling you how residents, even engineers, have been stumped over why key fobs and garage door openers just stopped working in one neighborhood. <laughs> Tonight, we now have the answer. Ray Strickland shows us how it took weeks to crack this case. Bill Camarada lives at the end of Virginia Avenue. It's the street where more than 10 people's key fobs and garage door openers suddenly stopped working. I really didn't think it was real because I have no problems on this end of the street. It was hard to believe at first until he drove up his street and was left scratching his head like everyone else. And sure enough, I could not open up my car door unless I was like barely right on top of my car. For weeks, no one knew why this was happening. Not the city, not the utility companies. And even after using a $15,000 spectrum analyzer, we also couldn't find the problem. The signal was bouncing off other houses, bouncing off the wires. The signal was so powerful, North Olmsted City Councilman Chris Glassburn says it was incredibly hard to zero in on one area. Their detection devices were being thrown off. That was until he and a volunteer used a deamplifier to mute the signal. It allowed for them to pick up the signal when they were close to it and after going door to door of about 40 homes they finally found the problem it was a uh, man-made uh, custom device uh, that was designed to notify that resident when someone was in their home glassburn says the device was the size of a shoebox he says the reason why it caused so many problems was because the person didn't design it the right way it was putting out a signal continuously and only when the signal was interrupted would it tell them <laughs> that an individual was in another part of the home. Now that the issue has been resolved, I'm glad they found it. Camrata says he is happy things can go back to normal. And Councilman Chris Glassburn says the person who did this had no idea his device was causing these issues in that North Olmsted neighborhood. The councilman said this was not malicious, just an honest mistake. Reporting in the newsroom, Ray Strickland, Channel 3 News. So here... It's an example of something we spoke about before, which is interference. So someone had had a DIY set up at home for his home security and was putting out a 315 megahertz signal. And that signal, that 315 megahertz, it was a DSB signal, DSB suppressed carrier, but it was interfering with the DSB suppressed carrier signal from the key fobs and 
all the garage openers and the, the, the car keys in that village stopped working. Did you notice in the video um, the engineers were referring to this device here, a spectrum analyzer or a frequency analyzer? Um, that, that's what I referred to before. It has a horizontal axis of frequency. So what those traces you are seeing on the screen, that was actually the, um, the spectrum, and that's how they actually picked up that 315 megahertz uh, signal. Okay, so that was DSB. For SSB, it's uh, less common, less likely you'll be using it. Remember we said that it has very good power efficiency because not only is there no, power, no carrier, there's also no LSB. You know, it could be no USB. There's one sideband transmitted, one sideband is blocked. So it's also less noise and less bandwidth. So these are all benefits. Low power efficiency, uh, good power efficiency, less noise, less bandwidth. Um, the fact that you need a complex modulation and demodulation is um, a disadvantage. So both at the transmitter, you need um, a high order filter and at the receiver, you need complex um, electronics to recover it. Um, so it, it is, um, it comes at that cost. Where do we use it? We use it for um, long distance voice signals and two way radios. So the kind of radios that um, you might have seen um, taxi drivers use. So these two way uh, signals or two way radios um, are very bandwidth conscious. They use very little frequency and the radios that are licensed for such use are SSB. Okay, and finally, vestigial sideband, we said the only application really where this is commonly used is analog television. And while I say it is commonly used, it won't be used for much longer because analog television is on its way out. So what you need to know is that the bandwidth for VSB is somewhere between that of SSB and DSB. But because VSB refer is typically used for television, then its bandwidth will still be, so the bandwidth of VSB, if it's for television, will still be greater than the bandwidth for um, AM if it's for um, audio. Simply because this is going to be in kilohertz and this will be in megahertz. So even though here we have 2 FM and here we have maybe 1.3 FM or something like that, this will still win out. But if we have an equal FM or the same message modulated using AM and VSB, then VSB will have a smaller bandwidth. So in summary, this is what I was talking about. So VSB will be somewhere between FM and 2FM, but it just happens that for TV, the FM here will be much bigger than the FM used here. Okay, so this is just a summary of what we've spoken about. In the previous four slides. Now finally a few examples, a few questions before we end the lecture. So I'll go through these quickly with you. So for a single tone message, what kind of modulation are you looking at? So what kind of modulation does that look like? Now we won't know unless we know whether this is a single tone message or not. I'm telling you that the message is single tone. So that means that this must be the upper sideband. This must be the lower sideband. And there should be a carrier somewhere in here. But there isn't. So clearly we're looking at something with two sidebands 
and no carrier. So two sidebands, no carrier. That's what we're looking at, double sideband, suppressed carrier. Now we're not told what the message looks like, we're simply told what kind of modulation scheme is this. So all we have is these two components. Now, is this the upper sideband? Is this the lower sideband? Well, the upper sideband and the lower sideband should have the same, the same power. They should be symmetric. And because they're not, then no. This is either entirely the upper sideband or entirely the lower sideband. So what we, what we probably think is that this is all one sideband. We don't know whether it's the upper sideband or lower sideband, but we can tell it's single sideband. Could it be VSB? Not really. For VSB, you need a continuous spectrum, not a single component. Could it be DSB-LC? Not really, because, well, where's the carrier? There's no carrier here. And if that's the carrier, if this was the carrier, and this is the lower sideband, where's the upper sideband? Could it be DSB-SC? Well, not really. Not, not with these asymmetric um, uh, sidebands. So the correct answer is it's single sideband. Okay, what are we looking at here? The question sort of tells us that there's a carrier frequency right there. And there isn't a carrier component. So immediately we can eliminate DSB-LC. And that isn't even an option. So there's no carrier component. We have an upper sideband. and a lower sideband. So it's not SSB, it's DSB. So we can eliminate that. Now, how many components are there? There's one, two, three. So it's a three-tone signal. We don't count these because these are simply reflections of these. So it's a three-tone DSB-SC. So we can eliminate that because there's no carrier. We can eliminate that because there's only three components. So it's a three-tone SSB. Sorry, three-tone message DSB. Very similar question here, but this time it's asking for the carrier frequency. So what is this frequency here? How would you find this frequency? Do we look at this? Do we look at this? No, these are completely irrelevant. The only frequencies that are relevant here are this frequency and this frequency. So your carrier frequency has to be right in the middle, symmetrically placed between the 80 and the 90. So your frequency, your carrier frequency will be 70 plus 80 over 2. That's your carrier frequency. What's the band pass bandwidth? It's a band pass, so we're talking about the actual modulated signal and not the message. So this is your band pass bandwidth. So it's simply the difference of the highest frequency and the lower frequency. So it's 100 minus 50. 
So that's your band pass bandwidth. Now I think this is very similar, but now it's asking for the message bandwidth. So the message bandwidth, another way for asking for that, it's the baseband bandwidth. So we're not asking for this bandwidth in total. We're asking before modulation, what was the band pass bandwidth? So you would be interested in the bandwidth from this carrier that doesn't exist to the highest frequency in the upper, uppermost sideband. That's your um, message bandwidth. Alternatively, you could look at that. It's exactly the same. It should be the same. So to find this, first we need to find FC. We need to find that so we can determine the bandwidth. So I think we've already established that FC is 75 kilohertz. So what you're looking for is 100 take away 75. So that's your message bandwidth. Now notice when what we're not doing is finding this. We're not interested in that. That's not your baseband bandwidth. Your baseband bandwidth is measured from the carrier to the highest frequency and not from this frequency here to there. That is meaningless. Okay, your baseband bandwidth is from the carrier to the highest frequency. Okay, so before we end, one final numerical question this time. So, one example, or one question answered three different ways. So, we're told that we have an SSB transmitter, and it's transmitting 100 kilowatts. And we're going to replace it with a standard AM signal. What does that mean? What does standard AM signal mean? It means DSB, large carrier. And it says the same total power. So the, the power will remain 100 kilowatts. And it says compare the respective carrier and sideband powers. So before and after. So what we have is this, and we're replacing it with this. The total power remains the same. So initially, we had 100 kilowatts all in this sideband. We now have 100 kilowatts in the upper sideband, the lower sideband, and the carrier. All together will be 100 kilowatts. So how much of this 100 kilowatts will go into the upper sideband? How much will go into the lower sideband? How much will go into the um, carrier? Now before answering it mathematically, um, we can sort of just look at it using a bit of common sense and our gut feeling. So we know, we know that the maximum efficiency of AM, that's, yeah, is 33.3%. That means that at best, we have 33.3 kilowatts in the upper and lower sidebands, at best. So at best, the power here and here is equal to 33 kilowatts. So that means that each sideband will have half of 33.3. So let's just write it as 16. 0.6 kilowatts in this sideband and 16.6 kilowatts in that sideband. And the remaining 
six kilowatts. is in the carrier. So that's one way of looking at it. You could answer it mathematically, remembering the expression for the power and the upper side band and the lower side band. Obviously, we're looking at the best case scenario where m equals 1. And you could answer it that way, and you'd end up with the same solution. Another way is using this expression. Remember we said we can um, relate the efficiency to the modulation index. And if you rearrange, you can find the power of each sideband and you get the exact same answers. So however you choose it, so there are three ways. This is, I call this the simpler of the methods, but actually just looking at it and remembering this efficiency, you can probably... Um, just answer it that way. So th that's three ways to answer a numerical question like that. So I hope you found that helpful. Finally, last thing I wanted to show you before the end of the lecture, um, another short YouTube uh, clip. So this is uh, channel one. This is the DC side of the lower diff pair. There's our modulating signal, and we can see that that modulating signal is sitting always above the base of Q6. So we're getting essentially amplitude modulation of our carrier. In this case, I've chosen a fairly low frequency, so it's easy to kind of see what's going on with the phase of the carrier as I adjust the DC bias. So as I adjust the DC bias of the modulating signal up and down with respect to the bias voltage at Q6, we can actually see the modulation depth changing. So we've got a shallow modulation depth with a lot of offset. And as I bring the signal closer and closer to the Q6 base voltage, we can see the modulation depth getting deeper and deeper until we get to the point where the negative trough essentially equals the voltage at the base of Q6, and we get to 100% modulation, where the carrier is essentially completely collapsed and has gone to zero at the lower trough of the uh, baseband signal. Now this is about as deep as you can bring the offset and still have amplitude modulation. This gives me essentially 100% amplitude modulation where we completely suppress the carrier at the troughs of the baseband signal. If we come up, we'll go with something a little bit less than 100% modulation. But if we continue to go down, we're going to get to the point where the carrier starts appearing again at the lower peaks, but it appears at a, uh, the opposite phase from the upper peaks of my baseband signal. As we continue to bring the offset down, we can actually see the peak-to-peak -peak magnitude of the upper trough modulation envelope start to decrease, but the, we're seeing now an increase uh, during the lower trough. And we get to the point where the peak-to-peak -peak value of both of those are the same. And this is now uh, double sideband suppressed carrier modulation, where the baseband signal is essentially following the alternatively following the positive peaks and negative peaks, positive peaks and negative peaks. We can see that going on here in the baseband. If we continue to bring the offset down further, we'll get to the point where we're, we revert back again to amplitude modulation. But now we're just biased the baseband signal down below the bias point, and we're back to an AM situation again. So you can see that simply changing the bias, we can go from amplitude modulation through double sideband suppressed carrier modulation all the way back up to AM again. But it'll also be helpful to look at the frequency domain content of the resulting modulation output. So let me turn on the FFT of channel 2 and uh, since our carrier frequency here is, is 18 kilohertz, I'm going to adjust the uh, center frequency of the FFT to be about 18 kilohertz. I'll adjust my scale so I can spread things out and now see my 18 kilohertz carrier and the two upper and lower modulation sidebands of that carrier. I'm going to adjust the position of some of these waveforms uh, up out of the way here so we can look at uh, things a little bit more clearly and just get these guys overlapping up top here. And I'll also. So you see, he's now superimposing a, a time domain oscilloscope display in the top with the frequency domain spectrum analyzer or a frequency domain plot in red at the bottom so don't don't be confused these are not 
both time domain signals. You have a time at the top and frequency at the bottom. Take and adjust uh, the center frequency to be just a little bit off. I get a little, make it a little bit easier to see uh, the carrier here if it's not lined up with the center radical. And I'm also going to adjust the uh, vertical scale of the FFT result to be 10 dB per division. So now we can actually see the magnitude of the carrier and the upper and lower sidebands here. Let's take a look at how these vary as I vary the DC offset on the baseband inputs. So of course we're generating AM here because our baseband signal is completely above the offset value. If I bring that up even further we can see it's still AM and all we're seeing now is that the magnitude of the upper and lower sidebands is lower with respect to the carrier indicating we've got a shallower modulation depth. As I bring the offset back down we can see that the sidebands are now coming back up again and the carrier is shrinking uh, still indicating that we've got AM but getting closer and closer to 100% modulation which is right about there. Now for a double sideband suppressed carrier we'd expect to see both sidebands there but the carrier being significantly suppressed. So let's bring the offset down. We can actually see that carrier now coming down. Now we're at a point where it's about equal to the strength of the sidebands. And if we keep going down carefully we should find the point where that carrier goes down pretty deep. Now of course I mentioned that the uh, these transistors are not very well matched. Uh, so there is going to be some offset things aren't perfect, but we can see that we've dropped that carrier way down in this case You know about 20 DB down from where the magnitude of the sidebands are which is about 30 DB down from where it was before Which is pretty good even considering that there's a lot of offset in this Gilbert cell So this obviously is double sideband suppressed carrier. We've got both sidebands there the carrier is suppressed uh, this is often used in uh, ham radio transceivers and things like that to generate single sideband by first starting off with this coming out of the balance modulator and then using a filter to select one or the other sidebands to generate upper sideband or lower sideband modulation. If we continue to bring my offset further down, we'll come back to the point where the carrier is being raised up again and once the input signal is fully below the bias point at the input uh, or the bias point on the other side of the diff pair, now we're back to AM and we see the familiar AM spectra here again. Now just to illustrate this a bit further, I've increased the carrier frequency to 10 megahertz to make it something that's easy for my shortwave receiver here on the bench to pick up. So if we got this set for amplitude modulation, I've got the receiver set to AM, I can actually hear that modulation tone which I've adjusted to 1 kilohertz. If I adjust that up or down, we can actually hear that. Okay. Now if I adjust the DC offset to go down to double sideband suppressed carrier, listen to what happens to the AM signal. You can actually hear a, kind of almost like a second tone because what's happening is the AM detector is detecting this envelope. And we can see the double sideband suppressed carrier basically creates an envelope that includes kind of a second harmonic component to it, and that's why we hear that other tone come in. I've turned on the FFT again to look at the uh, spectral content of the carrier. And we can see that for AM, we've got our carrier and the upper and lower sidebands. As we adjust the offset down, we can actually uh, see how that carrier uh, gets suppressed. Uh, and we're just left with the double sideband suppressed carrier modulation. So I hope this video has given you a better feel for amplitude modulation and double sideband suppressed carrier. Okay, so I hope you found that helpful. Um, it was useful to see um, the uh, time and FFT plots both uh, at the same time. It was also useful to um, hear that 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 uh, distortion caused by the envelope detector struggling to pick up the DSB. So that was uh, lecture five. We spoke about uh, DSB suppressed carrier, SSB suppressed carrier, and VSB. Now VSB still has a carrier with it. Um, and as I said, DSB is normally just referred to as DSB and SSB is referred to as DSB. So that was today's lecture. I hope you found it helpful. Next lecture, we'll be talking about the demodulation.
of DSB. We won't be looking at the demodulation of these two, but we'll be looking at the demodulation of DSB. After that is your class test on the 17th of March. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, until we meet again, stay home and 